Good afternoon, and welcome to Running a Value Proposition Exercise in Your Library, How-To Lessons from the ARL Liaison Institute. My name is Judy Rutenberg, and I'm with the Association of Research Libraries. It is my great pleasure to introduce to today's presenter, MJ Delia, Head of Learning and Curriculum Support at the University of Guelph McLaughlin Library. We have muted all participants today to reduce background noise. We do encourage your participation through the chat window box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. This session will be recorded, captioned, and made available on the Association of Research Libraries website in approximately one week, along with the presentation slides. Yesterday, you should have received a facilitator's toolkit to accompany this webinar. That toolkit will also be made available along with the recording. We thank you for joining us today and look forward to a terrific session. Over to you, MJ. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. Um, yeah, so welcome to Running a Value Proposition exercise in your library. I first should begin with a quick thank you to Rita Vine at the University of Toronto for uh, improving whatever title I had before this. Um, she definitely improved it, and I'm um, really excited today to uh, share with you. So we'll just move ahead here as some of you are getting your audio sorted out, it looks like. Um, for today's session, I've broken it down into smaller segments with each segment uh, divided by this uh, purple slide. And at the purple slide is a good chance that we can pause. And if questions have come in, and I encourage you to ask questions if you have them, that you would just uh, type them in the chat box, and then Judy can uh, highlight them and ask them. And so we'll have sort of these pauses at the purple slides where we can have a, have a conversation and clarify anything that's come up so that we don't have to wait for uh, wait till the end. So once again, I am MJ. I'm at the University of Guelph. You've got my email address there and, um, and a caricature. And if you want to tweet, there's my uh, Twitter address. And you heard from the intro, I, I work in the library. I'm in our, essentially our learning commons. But I also, I teach for our College of Business within the university. And I teach uh, entrepreneurship. So the stuff we're going to talk about today actually comes from some of my work with uh, the students who are studying entrepreneurship, the students who are trying to invent uh, new business ideas, and that sort of thing. And so um, what I like about being able to bring it back to the library is I think there's some great transferable uh, principles, while admittedly a slightly different discipline, as in business. Um, I think we've got a lot to learn. So I'm hoping that you see that today and hear that uh, today. And like I said, encourage questions as we go. What are you getting yourself into? Well, here's the basic agenda. I want to provide you with a bit of context and overview, which would include uh, a quick mention of the ARL Liaison Institute and, and sort of what we did there, as well as where does this value proposition conversation actually come from? And then once we've got that foundation, jump into the actual stages of designing a value proposition. And because this is a little bit more practical, this is the how-to portion, we want to wrap up with some things to think about if you want to have this conversation at your library with your staff. You know, what sort of considerations do you uh, need on the front end as you prepare? Uh, what works, what doesn't? And I'm sure some of that will also come out in the questions that we have uh, that you guys pose today. And at the end, if there's any overarching questions, happy to, to deal with that as well. So, that's where we're headed. Really, I have two basic objectives. One is to introduce you to the basic elements of a value proposition design exercise, kind of what is it, how do you do it, and, and really why would you do it. And the second objective is, as I hinted there at the agenda slide, is just to uh, offer tips for how you could do this, how you could start this conversation um, with your staff or with various groups. So I thought um, I would start, we're going to work color coded here. So here's a yellow, kind of an ugly yellow slide. But um, I wonder if, just to give a sense of who you guys are and who's on the other end of the phone that I can't see, um, in, one sen in one sentence, if you wouldn't mind typing in the chat box, you know, why did you choose to attend the webinar? What, what worked or what jumped out to you? And um, yeah, go ahead and I see some answers coming in. Uh, 
I'll just give you a second. Basically, we'll see if we can crash the chat box. How about that? Yeah, so tips and tricks. Looking for ways to present stuff. Interested in the concept. Intrigued by the title. That's good. Want to learn to pitch my ideas. Preparing for future assessment. Anticipating potentially using this in the retreat. Nice one, Aaron. I'd like to try it again with more information. Good. I'm glad people have already tried some of this stuff. Excellent. So, all right. I didn't see anyone say I joined to heckle MJ, so I'm excited about that as well. So let's let's jump in. I want to give you a bit of context here, um, and some of you will be, I'm sure, familiar with the ARL Liaison Institute from last June. Um, I should say at the outset, I was not on the original organizing committee and was more brought in as a consultant to help with the kinds of activities that would help the conversation. And so just a quick refresher, really that institute was a combination of librarians from Cornell, Columbia, and uh, Toronto uh, at Cornell. So there was about 45 to 50 of us. Um, a lot were liaisons, some were um, AULs, that sort of thing. And my understanding, again, as not being on the primary planning committee, at least initially, was you know, we're starting to think about liaison work and the future of liaison work. And when they asked me to help them with the session, I would um, like to, um, when they asked me to, to help, it was like, well, what, what do you want? What do you want to do? And we chose the value proposition activity, which we're going to talk about today, in an attempt to help people to think like users or like imagine themselves in the shoes of people who use the library. And it was sort of a, a way to flip it on its head. Instead of always thinking about it from our angle, what about the users? And the other part of the value proposition exercise, which we'll unpack today, is that it's about articulating the value that we think we bring. And I should point out here that last bullet point on the slide. It's not meant to be facetious at all. We bring lots of value. It's that we often only talk about it on our terms. And so the value proposition is an attempt to say, okay, we think we're bringing this value. Let's find out if that's actually accurate. So um, we chose that activity. And I'll explain roughly how it worked, and we can get into the mechanics towards the end of the webinar today. But we basically spent about five or six hours doing a value proposition, a set of conversations around the value proposition. And it was spread over two days. So we started the afternoon of day one, and then we had a number of things to reflect on on the morning of the second day. And it's sort of all in, maybe six hours, and lots of conversation, lots of uh, activity. So we structured the conversation this way just so you can get it in your, um, in your minds that we had basically 10 groups. So we took the 45 people that were there, divided them into groups of four or five. So we have 10 groups. And we assigned each of those groups uh, different customer segments. And we'll talk about segmentation in a second. But you know, so we had groups looking at uh, what does the liaison work look like when we're serving faculty, when we're working with um, international grad students, or when we're working with administrators, and started to try to unpack what liaison work actually looked like in relation to these segments. Now, the irony of today's session is we're doing a webinar on an activity that is typically very hands-on. So at the Institute, for instance, um, these small groups had a bunch of markers and sticky notes and lots of flip chart paper, and they're together in their conversations and really writing a lot of stuff down, debating and discussing, and here we are in a webinar with a sort of a one-way conversation. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about how this worked. So if you can imagine that kind of scenario where you're in a room, you've got a bunch of groups, and you know, they're typing their ideas, uh, or they're writing their ideas in marker on sticky notes, and they're debating and that sort of thing. So why don't I pause just for a second and see if, uh, if there are any questions. Just about the Institute, if I've clarified that for anyone, if there's any, anything related to that that would help you for today.
No, looks like you're good to continue. Look, we're good to go. Thanks, Judy. Um, all right. So if hopefully most of you received your toolkit, um, and I've I've tried to mark on the purple slides the approximate spot in the toolkit where the content comes from. So for this overview, it's really just that second page where uh, I want to talk a little bit about it and give you a sense of where the concept of the value proposition came from, at least not way back in the history of the value proposition, but just where this activity comes from. So you get a sense of the source material and also so that, so that you think, don't think that I invented this. Um, I want to acknowledge where it came from and, and encourage you to look up the original sources too. But before I jump in, I should acknowledge that there are business terms ahead. And, and I say that you know, kind of jokingly, but the reality is business conversations can be challenging um, in libraries for various reasons. Some people are uncomfortable with the management jargon um, and even just the philosophy of business to, to make money. And so I, I would just say a healthy suspicion is totally fine. We shouldn't stop critically thinking um, at all, but that we shouldn't also let the terminology be a barrier in the conversation, that this technique can indeed be insightful and helpful. And so I'm hoping it's not a, uh, not a barrier for, for most. But it's, it's helpful to know this as well if you plan to run a session, that you might get a bit of pushback on, you know, for instance, the use of customers. And I think your challenge as a facilitator and even today is just to say, Customers is that stand-in word, that catch-all word that's either if you prefer user, patron, or stakeholder, or constituent. It doesn't really matter. It's the people that use and need the services we offer. And similarly with the idea of value, in a business context, very, you know, value often just means can we make money? And in libraries that's much more problematic that way. And so we can think of value uh, a little more as you know, are we delivering what people need? Um, and I threw that last one in just as a joke because there's no synergy in today's presentation, I promise. So my journey to the value proposition exercise actually started with this book known as, um, known as the Business Model Generation. And um, this book hit the scene and then became like bestseller around the world. And I think what was interesting about this book was it was an attempt to say, Spending all of your time planning your business and writing huge financial plans uh, is almost a waste of time at the outset. What you want to do is figure out how your business works. And it's sort of seductive in the sense of this, this book focuses on a single tool, which I've got here, um, known as the Business Model Canvas. And really the premise of the Business Model Canvas is that you can describe your entire operation on one page with nine building blocks. And obviously it's beyond the scope of this webinar to talk about each of these building blocks, but I just want to point out that the value proposition is right in the middle. So your whole business pivots on the idea that you can provide value. In other words, provide something that your customers want. And if the right side, if you look at this canvas on the right side, you see everything that's customer facing. You know, your customer segments, how you're reaching them. And on the left side is infrastructure based. So it's all the things that we have to do as organizations to deliver the value proposition. Now what's interesting about this book is there's not actually not a lot on how to write a good value proposition. And I think they must have realized that because their sequel is, was the book uh, more recently, last couple of years, uh, published I think 2014, called The Value Proposition Design. And this is really the book where the activity comes from. And so it's very similar, I would say, um, what's perhaps different and very useful about this book is it's full of techniques and strategies and uh, ways to have these conversations. So I'll cover the basics today in terms of what we did at the Liaison Institute. But um, this book is very helpful, you know, $23 kind of, it's not expensive, and it's just got a great way and lots of tips for facilitating the conversation too. So it might be worth looking it up if you're really keen on this conversation to uh, get your own copy. So again, a quick pause for questions. See, there's been a few questions about getting the toolkit. Hopefully you guys can get that. Um, get someone to send it to you if you haven't seen it or search your email again. But are there any questions at this point? 
um, around things we've covered so far. I know we're still kind of intro at the intro stage. Looking okay. There was one comment um, that uh, this is a and um, that the given that our universities are um, may use this kind of business language, that it's good to be mm -hmm. familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, definitely good to be familiar with it. I mean, you know, you, you can be comfortable or not comfortable with the language, but it's it's helpful to at least be aware of it. Um, and I see a question there around. Uh, how does this relate to a book? Um, start the book. Start with why. Um, it's actually very related. That's a great book to read. Um, this is more the techniques of how to have that conversation and hopefully getting to the why. And I think you're going to see that in the next uh, the next section here. Okay. So let's let's jump ahead. Uh, first, basic definition. What is a value proposition? What are we trying to do? Um, there are lots of definitions, some more complex. I just like this one. It's simple. The combination of products and services that create value for a particular customer segment. But I should point out here, um, the first point I want to make anyway is that second part of the definition is that the value is actually in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the customer segment. So we may say a lot of things we do are really valuable, but if that value isn't at least recognized by the customer segment, um, then we have some challenges. And when you're doing uh, value proposition uh, design, one of the ways you understand the customer is using what they call the customer profile map. And I promise we'll unpack this in a second, but I just wanted to show it to you. And really the goal is to think of your customer and think of the sort of three broad buckets of what, what they're facing, you know, the kinds of jobs that they need to do, uh, what they're trying to accomplish, and then the frustrations they encounter. And so as we think through this, um, that's, that's a way to understand the segment. And again, we'll talk about it more in a second. Back to the definition here. The other part is that it's, it's a, a combination of things we offer, so, and very tangible things, products and services that they see value in. And when you're doing this exercise, there's a similar map called the value map for us to think about our response. So what do the customers need uh, is the first part, understanding who they are. And then the second part, what do we offer and how do we help them achieve what they want to achieve? So you've got a circle map and a square map, kind of straightforward, hopefully. And really, the whole activity is based on these two maps. And these two maps together, form the value proposition canvas. And so this is really what we did at the Liaison Institute and what we'll unpack over the next little bit here. And that as we dig deeper into the, each of these sort of segments in each map, we hopefully arrive at new insights and we hopefully see opportunity. I think when it comes down to it, value proposition is really about trying to answer the question, why would people choose us? Why do they want that product or service? Um, and some, sometimes that's an easier way to think of. Instead of trying to match a product and a service to a customer segment, it's just ultimately what we're trying to discover is why they want us and what we have and what we want to tell them about that. So if you're kind of on the fence here, you'd say, you know, what, why have this conversation? Uh, what are the advantages? And I've hinted at a few of them already. And there's more in your toolkit on uh, page 5 maybe, if you want to jump there. I just put a couple on the slides. But I mean for me, so this is again my perspective, but I, I think what's really valuable is it, it really does force you to look at the customer first and look at the whole customer, the user. So we're not just concerned, for instance, on you know, how an undergraduate student uses the library. We're concerned about what is an undergraduate student actually experiencing in their life? Because we have to compete with all the other things going on. Um, and so starting with trying to understand who they are, you know, and this touches on other areas. It touches on, um, it touches on like design thinking and being, building empathy for the user and that sort of thing. So I think it's aligned with other trends in libraries like UX or design thinking. 
the second reason I think it's really valuable conversation is, you know, once you get familiar with working in libraries, it's easier to make uh, assumptions about about the work and about the people who are using it. And it's not, you know, there's no uh, ill intention at all. It's just over time we we do shortcuts and we make assumptions. And value proposition design would encourage us to challenge and test those assumptions as we go. So the process actually builds in a way to check with your customers about whether they see the same things that you think you're seeing. Um, third reason, and this one, uh, you know, we talked a lot about this when we did the Liaison Institute, is just actually articulating the value. Um, that can be a challenge. We like to believe we offer lots of valuable or lots of value to campus, for instance, and want to believe in sort of the public good of libraries. But then when it gets to the nitty gritty, we're not always great at actually just clearly and succinctly in that short few sentences tell someone why they should come or why they should use that product or or that service. And so this this forces that kind of articulation, which I I quite like. And then a side benefit, and uh, having run this exercise a few times in different contexts, one of the, the best parts of having this conversation in your organization is it builds a, a shared purpose. You start to realize we don't all think the same things. And so for instance, at the Liaison Institute, you would overhear groups talking and they would start to realize, oh, we don't mean that when we, when we talk about that, or we don't have that here, or that's not the same in the department I serve. And so then you start trying to hash that out. It, you know, are those differences real? Are they perceived? What does that mean? And so it's a really helpful way to, to work together. I do want to jump into the steps, but we're at a purple slide here. So let's take a minute and just see what kind of questions have come in. So we have a question here from Brian Moynihan. Do you have any examples of completed business model canvases from libraries? Um, I don't offhand. I mean, I think it's an interesting activity to do even at a project level. So if you, you know, we can go back to the canvas. Um, but the, the project level is a way to sort of map out the resources that might be required on the left side and then ultimately who they're targeted at. The challenge with the business model canvas, and you kind of hinted at it with your question, is that the bottom of that canvas is all about the, the finances, so sort of the cost and then the revenue, right? And as revenue grows, then you can reinvest and that sort of thing. And, and that doesn't always work in libraries. So you have, to, you have to have a bit of creativity to determine it's not about increasing revenue. It's about maybe increasing uh, you know, return or number of users. Or, so you have to redefine that a little bit. Hopefully that helps. Um, we can chat off offline about how you might run a business model conversation if you want. Um, but I think we should stick to value propositions for today. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another uh, question, comment from Stephen Bell. Does the term solutions provider describe the value libraries could bring? Solutions that help you gain something you need or eliminate a problem or pain they have? Or is yeah. solutions too vague? Hmm. I think that's, a, um, that's something we could maybe play with throughout the rest of the webinar, to be honest. When we get into the value map particularly, I think that's where you can sort of see um, the value that or the gains that the libraries can create or the pains that we can reduce and maybe how that is seen. Um, I think solutions provider is a fine term, but it's pretty generic too. You know, I think my, my uh, telecommunications Telecommunications company is also a solutions provider, so we need to be careful. Um, but still, something worth thinking about and keeping in mind throughout the, the rest of the webinar. Okay. I think, I think we'll move on. All right. So the first um, first stage really is just landing on your customer segment. And, and so I'm, I don't assume that segmentation is a common well-known term, but you know, it, it comes out of marketing. It's really just how you break up a large group of customers or a market into a smaller and sometimes more definable group of customers. And, and you know, this can be uh, really important because you may have to not only 
market or send messages differently to these subgroups, but just they have different needs. And so while we are libraries, one of the best things about libraries is they're really like open and serve pretty much anyone who can come through those doors. Uh, the reality is each of the people that come through that door, the doors have uh, different needs and, and need different services from us. So we should be aware of that. Um, high level here, how do you segment? Sometimes we get that question. It's going to depend a little bit on the context, but you know, common areas in marketing anyway are geographic segmentation, right? Where do you live? Uh, demographic stuff around maybe age, your age or stage in life, that sort of stuff. Um, income or whatever. The third one, uh, more behavioral. And this one's interesting in the sense of it's a little maybe harder to define. It depends on context. But one example in the library community might be um, dividing by high uh, frequent users of the library or of the collection or whatever the topic is versus infrequent or non-existent. So you can see you can sort of divide. It might not depend what age people are, but their frequency might be really important. In, in a particular um, context. The last one, uh, marketers love the psychographic. Really just you know, your opinions and values about a given topic might put you in a different category. Um, you know, even what we've already talked about today, the, your comfort level with management terminology might, might sort of segment the group of uh, people attending the conference call today, for instance. So, um, so I just highlight those. I would give you a couple of tips if you're going to think about how to do this in your library. The first is it's best to choose a customer segment or user segment that you can actually access and talk to. Uh, it's pretty tough to offer services to people if you can't access them. So in this activity, you're going to think about who these people are, but then you also want to test your assumptions. And so you're going to want to talk to them at some point. So someone who's readily accessible, very helpful. Um, if possible, we want to try to move away from broad, generic categories. And, and I, I think we have a tendency to do this in higher ed and especially in libraries where we say, you know, well, we serve faculty, we serve undergrads, maybe graduates, you know, we have alumni. And so we group into these really large categories. But even within those large categories, we can probably segment further. And at least for me, I've found if you can focus uh, beyond, for instance, faculty and turn it into uh, early career faculty or to uh, faculty in a certain discipline, you at least are starting to narrow it to a, a manageable set. Now, does that mean all early, career, all early career faculty think the same? No, but it's a smaller group than all faculty. And so they may have different uh, needs. And it can also be helpful, and this may emerge over time as you do the activity, to find a segment that has a common objective. They're trying to accomplish the same thing or a common um, frustration or obstacle. If they're all facing the same pain, then um, they can sometimes be clumped as a segment to figure out, all right, that's a pain that lots of people have, lots of people across whatever spectrum we're looking at, and so what should we do about it? So the first step is as simple as figuring out who do we want to know more about. And again, I'll pause there, really give you a chance to um, yeah, let's throw in a question or two if we need some clarification. Any I think we have you? a question, uh, which okay. is, would an example of the pain points be uh, all remote users to the library? <laughs> uh, that depends on how good your remote access is, I guess. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And in fact, pain points leads us nicely into the next section. So I think we can hold that for a second. It will, pain points, all I'll say at this point, I think, is, is pain points depend a lot on the context. And there may be very obvious ones such as accessing maybe remotely. Um, but there may be things we hadn't considered as we start to um, talk to this customer segment or talk about this customer segment with people who work with them. So, um, but it's, it's, I guess the short answer is yes, it definitely could be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, anything else, Judy? 
We also have a comment from Rita Vine sure. uh, that the, uh, on the issue of solutions, that solutions may be more about us than them. And she suggests maybe it's more of a conversation and collaboration rather than solution. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point too. Thanks, Rita. All right, let's jump into um, stage number two here. So we've picked our customer segment, and now we start to, or we have to understand this customer segment. And as I mentioned earlier, we really want to understand them, at least using this activity. And there are, there are other ways to do this, but for this activity, is to think of this segment according to the three buckets you see here. So you want to think of their jobs and tasks, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, the gains. And gains is kind of a weird word, but I mean, ultimately, what are their desired outcomes in life? What are they trying to do? What do they want to do? And then their pains and frustrations. Um, and so if we, if we take a look at the first one here, uh, jobs and tasks. So it is our chance to sit back and think, all right, we've got this customer segment. What do they want to get done in their work and in their life? And, and I highlight that because one of the challenges in this activity is there's a tendency always to look at them through our own lens in the library and say, well, they need to do this and they need to do that, and they're very library-focused sort of things. And those are important to list because we're a library. But the goal of this activity is to really think from and be in their shoes, so think from their perspective. And so the goal then is to think, all right, what else are they trying to do in their life? And I hinted at it earlier. We're competing with everything else that's going on. And so we actually want to acknowledge that right now and get it up on the board. And this, if you're going to do this with your library, I'll just tell you right now, this, this is a challenging piece because we're so used to focusing on how we provide services to them instead of understanding where they're coming from. And so um, something to think about. Now, I've done a ton of talking, which is uh, unusual for an activity like this. Usually I would give instructions and you would go away and work on it. But we're in a webinar and that's kind of weird. So I thought we would do another chat scenario, and I would just give you a customer segment. So I want you to think of teaching faculty who are, trying to, uh, who are working on your campuses. What do they need to get done in their work and in life? And, and just throw some answers into the chat box. Um, you know, again, some library related. So some are trying to publish. Some are trying to design a course for next semester, grade papers, manage email, research, do advising. They're trying to teach. Imagine that. Get home in time for dinner. Perfect. So there's one that's outside the library. Save time. Grade papers. They may work at several campuses, so they've got travel, uh, research, design, integrate media and technology into their courses. Get tenure. Deal with their errant children. Hmm. Thanks for <laughs> Nice one. Uh, create engaging curriculum. Also learn how to teach over distance. Get tenure. Pick up kids from school. Answer students' email. Exercise. Be productive on several levels. Apply for teaching awards. Create conference presentations. Minimize teaching time to maximize research time. Emotional balance. Get grants. Look at these. Porn in. Excellent. Exercise. Run a marathon. Excellent. So, yeah, look at them. Porn. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna jump ahead. I think you guys are are right on that. These are people in, in their whole sense have a bunch of other things, including and often you know, dealing with family stuff and, and negotiating that balance. And so while we deal with one side of their life and we're not going to solve all their family stuff, uh, the reality is we have to be aware that that stuff exists because we have to somehow get a space uh, in their work life. And so if you look in your handout, uh, this is page 7, sorry, in your toolkit, I've listed a few prompting questions that can help this conversation. So as you guys just did in the chat box here, you were um, you know, top of mind, the first things that come to mind. So it's a, a short and quick brainstorm, which is great. And, and you've got a lot of great ideas. But sometimes it can be helpful to add some deeper prompting questions. And so I don't have a slide of them, but if you have your toolkit handy, you know, just look through some of those, those questions around um, 
you know, what do your customers need to accomplish that requires them to interact with others? What are the functional problems they're trying to solve? Um, are there problems that you can think of that they might not be aware of that they maybe haven't encountered yet? And so, so I'd encourage you, and in fact, if you buy the uh, value proposition book that I hinted at earlier, um, it comes with a whole sheet of prompting questions as a way to facilitate. I didn't include them because they're not mine. Um, I think some of these might be adapted from them, but um, it's a great resource. So the slide here in this light purple is just an example. And I borrowed this example from one of the groups uh, at the Institute. So they were given the uh, graduate student segment and said, what are graduate students trying to do? And you can see lots of stuff that is definitely in the wheelhouse of the academic library. But you can also see other things. Some of them may have kids, and some of them want to socialize and actually meet colleagues and you know, dealing with being a teaching assistant. And so you can start to see here the tasks um, can vary quite a bit. But it's important to understand, at least in the value proposition exercise, what are they trying to do? From there, we can go to the pains, the frustrations, things that they encounter. And to be honest, this, is, this one is typically the easiest to brainstorm. Everyone has a set of complaints uh, kind of in the bank ready to go. And so you know, if you think about it, what annoys these customers or this, this user group? What prevents them from doing what they want to do? And again, I'm going to ask you to just throw some ideas out there. So we'll stick with teaching faculty. Uh, what, what annoys them? What prevents them from doing their jobs? So we've got lack of time, time, tech that doesn't work, firewalls, IT issues, meetings. Yeah, that, can, that prevents me from getting stuff done. Uh, large class sizes, absolutely. Committee work, horrible websites, institutional passwords, copyright, uh, ebook, digital rights management, demanding students at 2 a.m. who don't want to go to bed, helicopter parents, yeah. Compliance issues, lack of sleep, lots relating to time, bureaucracy. No, that's not a thing in universities. Um, unaware, of resor unaware of resources. Department politics, definitely. Uh, course management systems. Rate my prof. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Pressure to publish. Assessment thing. Student complaints. Right. I must say, I didn't have a timer, but you guys were much faster on that one. So lots of pains and frustrations that we're aware of. Simple things, right? And, and things that, you know, not all of these things we can address, and we'll deal with that in a second, but... And sim a similar list, again, from the Institute... <coughs> excuse me. Um, around the graduate students, right? They may have conflicts with one of their advisors or one of their co-investigators or... Um, maybe they can't get the data they need. Maybe they're just depressed in general about the job forecast and the outlook. Uh, broken technology, similar to the ones, some of the ideas you mentioned earlier. Lack of study space, just dealing with life at that age. If you're, you know, if you went right from undergrad to grad, and dealing with relationships. Lack of time is a, another theme. So again, we're itemizing a list. Not all of these things, a library. Uh, addresses or deals with. And then the third part of our wheel here is the gains and outcomes. And you know this one can be interesting because it can be really tangible objectives, but I always try to push the group to you know, ask the why question and say, what's the, what's the deeper reason for why we're doing all of this? Um, you know, so what are the outcomes or the benefits that the customers want? Like I said, it, it could be as simple as you know, we want to succeed in school, but then the deeper why question is why do you want to succeed in school? And if you just keep asking why, you can sometimes get to these uh, deeper challenges and, uh, or deeper aspirations, sorry. And again, let's just do a quick brainstorm while we're here. So why, uh, what are the outcomes or benefits that teaching faculty want? Uh, they want a better job, prestige, 
tenure, contribute to the deeper knowledge base, career success, better pay, uh, they want more successful students, promotion, financial security, help students develop a passion for the discipline, they want a happy life, stipends, uh, make a difference in students' lives, they want interesting projects, high score on teaching evaluations, maybe earn a sabbatical, accolades, make their moms happy. It's a good one, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. These are all real pressures. So again, just uh, the other example with the grad students, you know, they're, they're looking for their future. They want to build their personal reputation, but also develop skills that make them employable. Looking for grants, uh, maybe they want to start a family or continue raising a family. Um, they want to improve their scholarly self-esteem, which was a great phrase from the Institute. Employable skills, attract grant money. So there are pressures that we absolutely know about and can probably insert ourselves into, and then there's a bunch that we can't. Um, so again, we'll, we'll pause for a second here for questions, but if you're doing this activity, and I, I'll show you an example of one that I've, uh, I did with some staff here. You're imagining this as a series of sort of three micro conversations. And what we typically do is we put a big circle on the wall and then we put sticky notes in the right categories. So this one was one we did uh, a year and a half ago or so when we were just looking at a pretty generic undergrad student and I would probably change that now. But we were trying to understand what does is, what is someone who's transitioning to university look like? And this was with staff from our learning commons. And I show it not to show you all the examples, but just to show you that now you're starting to populate this circular map. We're starting to get a fuller sense of who these people are, at least who they are through our eyes, is maybe the point to make at this, at right here at this juncture. So you can imagine at the Institute, we have 10 groups all having these conversations about different segments. And so around the room, you've got 10 maps, sticky notes everywhere, lots of ideas. And I'm going to pause right there and see if there are some questions around doing the uh, customer profile side. Okay, we do have a couple questions. Um, we have one from Catherine Steves who says that libraries do often group users broadly and that campus partners like the Registrar uh, or Alumni Affairs um, might help us to identify segments we're overlooking. So who, who aren't our users but could be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of really interesting things that happen in the, in the smaller segment. Um, and so as you start to identify them, you know, getting to know those segments, uh, whether you map them or not, but just trying to understand what, they're tr what they want to accomplish can be really helpful. That's a good point, Catherine. Rita um, Vine from the University of Toronto also um, has a blog post that we'll share in the chat window um, with some visuals of how the value proposition exercise went last summer at the Institute. So, um, in addition to what you just shared on the slide, MJ, um, mm -hmm. people can, can take a look at that in the, in the chat box. Awesome. That's really good. And then we have a comment um, again from Stephen Bell who says that the value of the library for faculty can largely be about helping save time, but they don't always know how we can do that for them. Mm -hmm. and, and really that's the crux of the issue is that we know we can offer that, but we're either not communicating it or articulating the tangible ways that we do that. And so hopefully this kind of activity can start, uh, can start to help, uh, have that conversation locally and start to understand that and then start to be, uh, we, we have a consistent message then um, and, and start, and then faculty start to see that hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here from Martha Conway. When in the process do we ask the customer segment itself about uh, their jobs and tasks and pains and frustrations? Uh, Martha, great question. If I had a chocolate bar, I'd give it to you. But um, no, this is, this is the key. And so you've highlighted the one drawback to sitting in a room by ourselves guessing about the customer segment. So um, let me just go back a slide. Um, when we did this one, uh, we took our best stab. And then before we moved on, we went out and you know, we have access to lots of undergraduate students here, so we just started asking them, when you look at this uh, map, does this make sense to you? Do these things really matter? 
Uh, did we miss things? And we open the conversation. And you don't have to do it with too many people before you start to see, oh, there's some glaring omissions, or there's some things here that they don't actually think are frustrations. And so um, I would definitely recommend that. In the case of the Institute, part of it was having a conversation between three universities who, although have similar models, are very different culturally. And so it was a bit of sharing among the profession. But absolutely, you've hit the, the nail on the head is, we wouldn't want to do this too long in, in kind of a meeting room and determine that we've solved all the problems of people that we haven't talked to yet. So you have to figure out the best way to engage. Um, and I've got a few suggestions at the end uh, of the process, but this might be a chance to, if you're doing this in your library, to press the pause button and then go access that customer segment and just double check. That's a great point. Anything else, Judy? Nope, I think you are good to continue. Good to continue. All right, so we've talked about the customer segment. Maybe we've gone out and even talked to them, which would, is the ideal as we just mentioned. Uh, stage 3 then in page 10 to 12 in your toolkit is really looking at what we offer, starting to describe the products and services. And just like the customer profile map, we've seen the square one here has three categories. The first where you articulate products and services that we think there might be a match, that they might be interested in. And then perhaps a little bit more challenging, and we'll, we'll get to these, is how do they help? Not just that we think that we'll want them, but what pains and frustrations do they relieve, and what gains or desired outcomes do they help uh, our customer segment achieve? And so we'll take the first one here in green, the products and services which to be honest is really straightforward. What products or services do you offer that your customers would in fact be interested in? And uh, again, I'm going to throw you one last brainstorm here and say if we're thinking of teaching faculty or faculty who have a lot of teaching on their plate, what do we do in the library that they might want? And you can think of your local context and throw some ideas in there. Um, so we've got uh, course reserves, interlibrary loan, tech support, e-reserves, we maybe help create assignments, assignment design support, webinars, systematic reviews, uh, research guides, copyright clearance, information literacy classes, 3D services, um, full text of articles, classroom tech that works great. We can have them check out technology like iPads. Uh, we've got writing centers, information apps, you can offer them scanning, a coffee shop, um, helping working, working with their student study groups, help them purchase materials, provide support for open access. Exactly. So as we start to articulate um, all of these things, we again just brainstorm them. So when I gave this task to the group at the Institute related to graduate students, of course it depended on who was in the group and what they knew and what, about what the library offered to this particular group. But you know, it can be specialized services like GIS. Um, it could be future services like, you know, here's your salary expectations in this field. Um, we could help them document their impact for, uh, you know, promotion or for applications, that sort of thing. Uh, provide a place for them to put their stuff in the repository. You know, so you can see there's a range of things that we think they might, in fact, be interested in. So as we uh, push on to the second part, it's simply the things that, the frustrations that they have that we might help uh, relieve. So again, how do your products alleviate the customer pains? And how will you reduce the frustrations in, in maybe their experiences as you go? So in this case, I didn't give you a brainstorm because it depends a lot on the local context. And there's a bit more thinking involved here is just to say, you know, ultimately, are we saving them time? Are we saving them money? Are we saving them some sort of effort some way? Are we making things easier? And so there's uh, usually when you do this in a group, there's, uh, it's a longer conversation. The ideas don't come as quickly because you're trying to articulate what exactly are we relieving when we have this. Um, if you flip to your toolkit on page 11, again, you can see some of the deeper prompting questions. 
Um, so can the library's products or services produce savings in terms of time, money, or effort? Um, can we fix underperforming solutions? And which ones can we fix? Um, let's see. Can we eliminate or eradicate common mistakes that the customers make? Can we eliminate barriers? And so what's interesting here is that it does tie back to the set of pains that we discussed when we talked about the customer segment. So if we understand what their frustrations are, which ones can we relieve? And it's hinted at in the comments, and you know, we can't relieve all of them. We still have to stay on mission as a library, but we have to relieve you know, the ones that are related to us, what are we doing about it? And so that's, that's kind of our task as we start to wrestle with these questions. And for the students, for instance, for at the Liaison Institute, the group talking about grad students thought, you know, I've only picked a selection. They had way more ideas than, than the ones I've listed. But you know, we offer citation management tools. Those can be really helpful as they embark on long-term research projects. Um, we're always here to help, and we're not judgmental about it. We can help them find grants. We can save time by giving them good quality remote access from anywhere in the world. Um, we obviously pay for a lot of very expensive resources, and that is a real value because grad students can have access to them. Um, you know, we help them reduce some anxiety about teaching. So you start to see these aren't just quick off-the-cuff ideas. These are a, an attempt to articulate how and why, and is it, is it the time, is it the money, is it the effort? What is it that we're doing that's relieving their frustrations? And then the last one, the third one, is the, the gains. What are we doing that helps push them forward, really, is a way that I like to think about it. You know, how do our products, how do our services help them accomplish what they want to accomplish? You know, we want them to achieve what they want to achieve, and so how do, we, how do we do that? How do we give them that momentum? And again, I'll just point you to um, page 12 now in the uh, toolkit for the same sort of set of prompting questions. You know, it's how do our products and services exceed their expectations? How do we make their lives easier? And not just, I mean, better usability in a more intuitive website is good, but is that sufficient? You know, how do we push for really helping them uh, accomplish what they want to accomplish? And how do we push at some of the deeper stuff? They have broader aspirations than just getting a good grade on an assignment. So how do we help them with those broader things? And, and these sort of challenges, and again, these aren't as easy to just rhyme off. There's a lot, typically a lot of discussion among groups, you know, are, what are we helping with? And this is why I think this is where the meat of the conversation, as we do a bit of inward, um, as we look inward, this is where the meat starts like, okay, do we all agree that this is why we do this, and, and this is the value we're actually creating, and this is the gains we're creating for them. So if I, again, just Example-wise, the uh, institute for grad students, well, we help students enhance their communication skills and give them access to resources and provide, again, here's your citation management angle. We, we help them increase their efficiency. Uh, maybe we even pr promote their work through some of our programming or poster sessions or that sort of thing. And we also know they need, need to study, so we've got dedicated quiet study space. So we'll, we'll pause here in a second for some questions. But again, just as I think back to a project we were working on where we were trying to come up with some digital strategies, um, the, this is our kind of response. So as we think of how do we reach people, especially undergrads, more digitally, what kinds of things, why are we doing this? What is it that we're helping them accomplish? What is it that we're relieving? What are the frustrations we're relieving? And then you know, having that conversation. At the Institute, this would be the second map that they've done. So after we've gone through this, we now have 10 groups, two maps each. We have 20 maps full of sticky notes trying to draw lines between what the, we think the customer segment needs and what we offer, and recognizing that some things don't fit. So I'll pause there for a second because I think there are maybe a couple of questions that have come in, and I'm happy to try to answer those. Okay, we have a question here. Should we also be asking 
How are our products better than our competitors? Um, for example, how is the library institutional repository better than academia.edu? And how is the library citation manager better than whatever faculty tell us they're using now? <laughs> yes. Um, so the short answer, I mean, that's a fantastic question. The short answer with the value proposition exercise is really this is just the first part. We articulate our value, but we have to be aware of the broader environment. And so for that I would refer you to the business model generation book. There's a whole set of questions about the competitive landscape. So remember it's a business book, so they're talking about the environmental scan, you know, the external factors that impact your ability to succeed. But I think even that could be really well adopt, uh, adapted to our context and we start thinking like, all right, we have to be aware of these other things that the faculty, uh, in this case in this question, are, are maybe looking at or considering and not just be afraid or dismissive of it. If it's being seriously considered by our segment, then it's up to us to have some sense of why they see value there. I know it's not a great answer, but I would just point you to business model generation book. Uh, I think it's maybe the fourth chapter where there's a lot around um, the environment, the broader environment. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, from Brian Moynihan, have you ever employed design fiction, uh, narratives about a future state to help envision new solutions? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm aware of them. I haven't facilitated that kind of conversation myself. Um, I might say if you want to employ that strategy in this technique, one way to do that might be to actually go to the, the customer segment that you're looking at. So for instance, teaching faculty, and, and start to ask them about what they want um, or what they might see value in new solutions. I think a design fiction narrative might be a, a different technique, a slightly outside of the value proposition, but that would be my first take at it. Again, happy to chat more offline and if that wasn't satisfactory. Okay, practical question. How much time would you recommend uh, allowing for these uh, exercises if, for example, the department was on an all-day retreat? Yes, good question, Adriana. Um, I, if you go to the last part of the toolkit, I've set up um, a couple of sample agendas for you. So if you have three hours, here's how you might have the conversation, uh, sort of a half day scenario. If you have a full day, um, the kinds of time timelines you might need. Obviously these would all be adjusted based on whatever else you wanted to cover and whether you wanted to spend time talking with the customer segment that you were focused on, you'd have to incorporate that. But um, I think minimum, if you want to have it in a one sit down conversation, you probably need uh, to move pretty quickly. You've got three hours maybe. Another strategy is just break it up over a series of meetings. So do the customer profile map in one meeting, maybe take an hour, come back after some reflection and do the value proposition, or sorry, the value map, canvas the square one at the next meeting and then just debrief it over a series of meetings, which can work too. It just depends on the size of your team and you know, pulling everyone together. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here too about um, either can you make the distinction or is there a strong benefit to making a clear differentiation between what is a gain creator and what is a pain reliever? Um, so yeah. just a question about that distinction. Yeah, actually, and that's a fantastic question that always comes up at this stage. And I'll admit, I've wrestled with it myself. And it's not really well defined, in my opinion, in the book differently. And uh, I'll tell you the resolution I've come to. And that is, it is true. You can phrase a pain reliever just more positively as a gain creator. And, and then it's sort of like, they're the same thing. But where I think the distinction is, is whether the customer side views it as a pain or a gain. So for instance, if they really feel like you know, remote access is a frustration, then I would keep it in the pain reliever category because what you're doing is recognizing they see it as a huge pain, we're relieving that pain. Rather than say they see it as a pain and we're creating a gain, if that makes sense. So I, I like the alignment of going back to where we think the customer segment would categorize whatever the issue is. Um, I hope that helps. It, in some ways, it's six of one and half dozen of the other. Like if it's a gain creator, fine, and a pain reliever, it could still work. It's not like it's 
invalid in one of the in one of the sections. I just think if you tie it back to the customer, there's a better chance um, that you're going to send a clearer message later. Hope that helps. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think I think we can move on. We can move on. Okay. So in the fourth stage, in some ways we've done two separate activities. We've we've looked at the customer segment, and then or and then uh, looked at the value that we create or produce as the library. And really, what we want to do in a true value proposition, and you heard, you saw from the definition earlier, it's bring those two together so that we're acknowledging that the library has certain elements that appeal in a certain way to a specific set of people. And so this is that point where we're, we're taking all of this brainstorming conversation, hopefully some confirmation, and, um, and we're looking at where, where we're at. Putting them together, and you can see, so this is just the examples from earlier, and in this context we were looking at undergraduate students, and as a number of you have pointed out already in the chat, the library is not going to address everything that an undergrad student needs. Right? You come to campus, maybe you want a romantic partner. Probably not something the library wants to really facilitate. You may meet in the library, but it's not on our mission to make that happen. And so we have to acknowledge, and then this is that stage where you go, okay, these are important things we should be aware of, important desires, important you know, frustrations, but that we can't solve those. They're not really for us. But which ones can we solve or which ones can we assist with? And so that's where there's a bit of sorting out early on at this stage. And there are many ways to go from this to uh, a set of sentences. I'm going to show you the one that we did at the Institute because I think it's the most straightforward. And um, I'm on the learning side of the library, so when we write like learning outcomes for instance, it's a little more like that where there's a rhythm and an expectation. and and so. Um, the activity that we did was called the value proposition and ad lib. It's basically a fill in the blanks kind of activity. So the parts that are, are in purple on this slide are the parts that you swap out. Um, so it's a little bit, it's awkwardly laid out here, but um, I think the example on the next slide will show you. Basically what you want to do is think of making a clear statement. What are the products or services? Who do they help? And what are the people that they help? What do they want to do? And then the last part is some clarification of how. So I know that looks really confusing. Let's take it one step at a time here. So the first one is some libraries have uh, an open access fund. So we want to say, all right, if we're going to come up with an explicit statement of value, let's try this one. Our open access fund helps mid-career faculty. So this is a particular described segment that we've been thinking about. And how does it help them? You know, or what do they want to accomplish? So in this case, what are mid-career faculty trying to do? Well, one option, and this again is borrowed from the, an example from the group in the institute. So our open access fund helps mid-career faculty who want to amplify their scholarly impact. Okay, that's good. But why or but how does it do that? How does it help them? So we have this fund because it increases access to their research. So this statement then, this is our attempt to take all of what we've been talking about and boil it down into one statement. Now the, the temptation here is to say, great, we're done. But the reality is there are many ways, and the encouragement in the book really is that you're prototyping multiple statements. Because we don't know, for instance, whether this is of any value to mid-career faculty. We think it is in our conference room and in our retreat, but we're not sure. And so the goal with Value Proposition AdLib is to start producing a number of these. And so at the Institute, we actually did that. We had each group start to write these statements. And then the following morning when they came in, they were up around the room, probably had 20 statements, 25 statements up around the room about the value of liaison work. And then in that case, we just said, respond, write notes on it. Do you agree? disagree, what's working, what's not. So we've come down to a succinct, a succinct, explicit statement of value, but even then, we're not sure if it's right. And so this is part of that process. It's just iterative. You're continually um, asking. But we're getting closer now to 
understanding why we have an open access fund, who it's for, what we hope it does for them. And now, of course, and just going back to one of the questions from earlier, we need to find out whether they see that same value. Because um, it might be a great idea in our circles, in our libraries, in our profession, but is it a good idea to mid-career faculty? That's the thing we still have to test. So like I said, the, if you get the value proposition design book, there are a number of other ways to get to a value proposition statement. But I like this one because it's simple. It's a bit of a plug and play, and it's, it's easier to do that uh, in the group. And at this point, I'm gonna, I see a couple more questions might have come in. So let's, let's pause again. We're nearing the end, but let's pause again. Okay, we have a question here from Rebecca Sturr. In keeping with the idea of thinking from the user perspective, would it be better to start with the need first? So our users need to accomplish XYZ, we can help, yeah. we can help through, and then move to the services by developing such and such services. Yeah, I mean, and I would encourage you to experiment. So I don't know that there's a right answer or a wrong answer to that question, or even to drafting a value proposition statement. I used the one that I showed you in the institute partly because it was a formula that meant everyone in 10 different groups came up with a similar sentence structure which made comparison easier. But in the case of your context, it may absolutely make sense to go, actually let's start with the user and then end with our response to the user. And if that seems to just fit better, absolutely I'd encourage you to, to do it that way. I think really the point that we're trying to get to is that we understand what needs we're actually meeting and, and who we're meeting them for. Good, good question. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, I see no more okay. questions at this point. No more questions. All right. So the last stage, and, and we've talked about it a little bit earlier, is, is really we have to get to that validating that we're even on track. And so there's lots of ways to think about this. And in the case of the Liaison Institute, it was really difficult to validate and check anything because we were doing a retreat with three different libraries, you know, sponsored by ARL. And so there's a sort of a broader conversation there. But in, in marketing terms, in business model terms, and in value proposition terms, they talk about fit. And so there's three types of fit. And if you're on track, you'll sort of negotiate through each of these stages. And I want to outline them a little bit and then talk about what you need to do. And if you're in your, um, if you're in your toolkit, they're there as well. There's a lot of text there, so I apologize for that. But um, page 14, the first fit is what we're looking for is a problem-solution fit. So we want to understand the, uh, the problem and that we've designed or at least imagined a solution that matches. And typically, if you've done the exercise we've just talked about where you've looked at a customer segment and identified the jobs, pains, gains, and started to articulate a value proposition at the end of that, um, you're kind of at that problem-solution fit. But what's absolutely missing is whether the customers agree with your value proposition statement. And so you really, you're still at the creative writing stage where you, you think you're on track, but you don't know for sure. And so the next step is really to test, um, uh, to test whether the customers see the same value. And you could do this in lots of ways. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, and this is on page 14 in your toolkit. I mentioned the first uh, strategy earlier, which is just sit down and talk to the customer segment and say, this is what we thought when we're trying to describe people in, you know, teaching faculty facing the challenges in work and life that you are, does this make sense? Did we miss anything? So you're just doing a bit of uh, customer interview style. Another approach in, is to just start looking at the uh, matches between your two canvases. So you know, are there pains that have clear and direct pain relievers? And are there you know, gains that your user wants that have direct and clear gain creators? And where are those obvious lines? And so I will say one of the groups at the uh, Institute uh, spent a lot of time, and they did the matching strategy. They just spent a lot of time connecting a sticky note 
on one side of the canvas to a sticky note on the other side and trying to articulate what exactly that relationship looked like. And that got them a little closer to understanding why we think that problem uh, can be solved with this solution. But really, it's still early days. So you want to move on then to the next kind of fit, which can take some time, but it's called the product market fit. So again, these are obviously from a business context, but at this stage, you know customers are using your product or service. That probably usage is increasing. So a market is starting to emerge. And usually you would say, this is starting to show that the value proposition is on track, that there's some value here. And people are seeing that, and so they're voting with their feet. right? They're starting to use it, or they're moving away from whatever they used before to your solution. And so you're not quite done though. <laughs> You know, people can really use your service, uh, but they can also overwhelm your service. And, and so you've got to figure out, all right, what is the demand going to look like? You know, we're on track. People like what we're doing, but is the value there? And so that moves you into the last, um, the last fit, which is really beyond the scope of this webinar, but what they would call a business model fit. And that brings us way back to the beginning when I showed you the first kind of business model canvas, and you remember the value proposition was right in the middle. What you would have at this time when you have a business model fit is you would have a value proposition that customers want. So you have a set of products and services, clearly articulated value. They keep coming, but you also have an infrastructure, uh, a support set up. You've got resources allocated, and you've got a balance. So you balance between we can deliver this value while we also have all of the infrastructure behind it. So again, I would refer you to the business model generation book in this case, um, and, and just look through some of their advice for how to balance. But this would be an, an indication that not only is the value worth it, but that the organization can continue to deliver that value. And that's one of the things you have to face in libraries too. We have limited resources. We can't do everything for everyone. So it's entirely possible, if I just go back a slide, that we have a growing market that really loves our service, but that service is too costly for us to deliver for whatever reason. It's too user in, or staff intensive or time intensive or money intensive. And we might have to actually say either we change that service a little bit or we have to stop because the market, we can't actually reasonably and sustainably deliver that. So let's, uh, I want to jump to more of the mechanics of the how as we wrap up, but let's pause here for questions. Um, thanks, MJ. We have a question from David Scherer. Could you articulate, could one articulate the business model fit as library strategic plan fit? Could you articulate the business model fit? Oh, yeah. Actually, you know, that's a. Let's just go back a slide. Definitely one way to think about it. Um, you know, and it, each organization is a little bit different, but. I mean, ultimately, it's if we're seeing the traction that a particular service or a combination of products and services uh, are getting, then recognizing that that then fits the strategic plan, that that means resources have to be diverted um, or, or found for that kind of thing, and that there's a commitment to that. I think that's a great way to think about it. Um, because in a business model sense, it's about, all right, now we can scale, grow, we've got revenue, we can you know, reinvest, that sort of thing. That's not typically how libraries think about things. So yeah, maybe it's more about we now fit within the strategic model. Great. Or the strategic plan, sorry. Thank you. Another question, are value propositions being used as a foundation for assessment? Um, that's a great question too, Rebecca. Um, I would say they, they could be. So remembering that value propositions come out of management literature, uh, assessment to be crass comes down to the bottom line. You know, people like it enough to keep buying it and keep making money and sustain the organization. I think our challenge might be to, to turn that internally and say, is it enough then if we think of assessments as more than um, just usage metrics, for instance? Like usage is a good indication that we're on track. We've got people who like the service and keep coming back. But we might want to challenge ourselves to dive a little deeper. Um, I would say I haven't done myself a ton of work at the assessment stage. Typically I'm facilitating the upfront conversation 
a round value proposition, but I think, you know, it, it is a really good conversation to talk about assessment. I think we are talking, for instance, about uh, our assessment often lands at just assessing products and services. And if you can somehow connect it back to this segment and talk about assessment from their eyes, from their perspective, might be valuable as well. And I apologize, I don't really have a better answer for that, but I think it's an important thing to think about. If we're going to start to articulate our value proposition, then how will we know we're successful? Still a helpful question to ask on the front end. Okay, uh, Ken List asks, what is the relationship between value and outcomes? Value and outcomes. Um, can we get a bit of clarification on that, Ken? If possible. I just, I'm not sure about the outcomes part. Or Judy, if you have a sense of what. I don't, but why don't we give, uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, Shanika Morris suggests value is what you deliver, outcomes are what you measure. Oh, so I think, I mean, I would put that along the same lines as my answer to Rebecca then. If, that, if that's a distinction we want to make, we definitely want to continue to deliver the value. I think asking the question then, what outcomes would we expect um, if this was, successful and we're on track. And then the other question that always happens in assessment then is like, how do you measure it? Because goodwill and even good usage is not always enough. So um, I think the question will depend a lot, a lot on whatever the service or product is that, you, um, that you're actually trying to measure. Okay, we got okay. 10 minutes left. Sorry, Ten minutes left. Okay. A uh, quick comment from Stephen Bell. Perhaps we'd want to identify the outcomes we aspire to, and then identify the products and services that deliver value related to achieving those outcomes or that outcome. Um, does this backward design work here? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, part of part of this activity with value propositions, at least the reason I like using this activity is to have that conversation. I think what it also does is provide you the freedom to figure out what works in your context. So for instance, if we want to work backwards, after we've talked through this value proposition uh, canvas and we've looked at customers and looked at the value, then say, all right, what do we do now? It's an important conversation then to turn, take the reins back as a, as a staff group or team or wherever context you're looking at and determine where do we go from here? But it, it's a process that provides that freedom, but at least provides a foundation initially to, um, to dig into the customer segment to try to understand where the needs might be. Um, again, I'm not sure that I'm fully answering this. I'm happy to, to take that to a phone conversation or something offline if you're really keen. Sounds good. Let's move on. Let's move on. So I think we're right on track here. Um, so we've, we've talked through basically the, the theory, the, the mechanics of the activity, but I know some of you are on the call here because what you're interested in is how do you actually do this conversation? And what do you need to think about? And I've had a few of these conversations again in various contexts, so I'll just throw some questions out to you. Again, I don't know for sure. Um, what you're after, but these are things that I like to think about when someone asks me to come and do a session or I'm thinking about doing one here. And I'll talk through them a little bit, but I want to leave some time again for questions at the end or questions about these. So I'll go fairly quickly through the next few slides. What is your objective is one of the things you have to think about right away. Uh, do you want to start a conversation like we did in the ARL Institute or Liaison Institute? Or do you actually have a problem that you want to solve and you need all hands on deck for? Depending on your answer to that question, and there may be other possible answers, uh, will impact the design of your workshop. The second thing I like to think about is what do you want them to take away? So what are the deliverables? If we're going to invite everyone to come to a three-hour workshop or a full-day retreat, what are the tangible takeaways that they're going to get? 
And then you will always get the question at the end, so what are we going to do with all this work? And many of you will know that, and many of you may have asked those questions. And so thinking a little bit ahead, what are the next steps after you ask all of these people to spend their time working on this? What is your commitment as a facilitator or as an organizing group or whatever? Um, Timeline is important, and I'm sure many of you are planning sort of staff retreats in the uh, spring summer season. So when is everyone available is just a simple logistical question, but it's also helpful to know like, when do you really need answers on some of this stuff? When, what's going to impact the change? Um, you know, what are the other organizational realities that you're facing? Where should you host the meeting? On-site, off-site? I have no opinion on that one other than it's really helpful if you have a flexible space with movable tables, that sort of thing. Who needs to be there? Usually when I'm invited it's, it's just staff, but I think it would be really interesting to have this conversation with more stakeholders in the room, including even possibly members of the group that uh, you might be trying to understand. Uh, you know, even if it's just an hour panel with early career faculty to understand them and maybe ask them questions or have lunch with them uh, can be helpful. I'm often asked what's the best group composition and how do you assign groups? And if I'm not asked it, then I usually ask whoever's wanting me to come. And um, this again depends a bit on your objective. So three options I can imagine right off the top is you just randomly assign people to groups. It gets people working with people they don't usually work with, but sometimes people lose interest too if they're you know, not with someone they want to be with. You can let them select. Um, you can also just assign groups ahead of time. As far as group size, I think four to five people is probably the best. And uh, they get too big, there's, it's either harder to get to consensus or people uh, disengage a little bit. And if it's too small, it can feel overwhelming. <laughs> so I like uh, four to five people. Um, how will participants select their customer segments? Um, you can do it randomly, just draw out of a hat, you can assign it. You can let them choose. Again, depends a bit on your objective for the meeting. If you want to solve a problem, then you don't want to leave a lot up to chance. If you want to just have a conversation, then random can work. Uh, should you order food? Yes, you should always order food. Always. People like that. Um, I'm going to buzz through these. I only got a couple more slides left because then we can have wrap-up questions. So you've decided to have a session. You've got it set. You've answered all of those earlier questions on timeline. What should you do in advance? Uh, obviously gather your materials. I like to draw the charts, the maps that you saw, so the customer profile map and value map ahead of time so that they have a big chart and they're not trying to draw it themselves. Um, if you've got handouts or prompting questions, some of that kind of a team toolkit for what they're going to encounter, get that done ahead of time. If you are planning to assign groups, then you definitely want that done ahead of time. Uh, I sometimes ask whether you need PowerPoint or not. I tend not to rely on PowerPoint, but the advantage of PowerPoint in a room that's full of uh, small groups talking is that you can put clear instructions up on the screen. And so it can be really helpful to have a screen with something uh, with PowerPoint up so that uh, they can see and groups can kind of self-monitor and stay on track. And the last thing, and someone actually hinted at it earlier, uh, outline your rationale. So start with why. When you begin that session, make sure everybody knows why they're there and what they're trying to accomplish. And that sounds simple, but it can be hard. You have to under, help them understand the context, the need for the conversation, what you hope comes out of the conversation. So doing some upfront thinking there can really help. And let's see, oh yeah, just one last slide. Remember the basic stages that we just went through of the activity. Get your customer segment, understand your customer. Think about your library's response to that customer. Try to connect them by articulating the benefits and then really start to validate, start to figure out whether we're on track or not. So we've gone through a lot of stuff, and uh, I'm, we're pretty good on time. We've got a few minutes left. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, and I should say just before those come in, if at any point you know, you're reviewing this and you have questions or you want to run a session and you want to give me a call, I'm happy to try to help. I'm not an expert, but I've done this a few times, so I can give you my two cents. Sorry, go back to that last slide. Yes, happily.
So are there any outstanding burning questions? Well, we do have a comment from Rita who reminds us that in the final report for the Liaison Institute, which is available on the ARL website, there is an appendix that has additional kind of organizational details about uh, you know, how to do a multi-library event, which that was. Oh, so um, cool. people want to look yeah. at that report as well. Definitely. Okay, I've got a question here. How do you or do you publish to customers? How do you publish? From Andrea Stewart, can we get a bit of clarification on that? Hmm. Publicize maybe? Do you, oh, share the work. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that may depend a little bit on your local context. I, I like to do it in the sense of um, just laying it out as we're working through a process and we're at a very rough stage, but we don't want to get too far afield, and so help us understand this. So that might be, for instance, when you've done your customer profile map, that round one. But you could also do it later when you've got a statement and just ask people to respond. So, you know, what do you think of this? Um, to be honest, some of the more challenging conversations actually come from staff. So, you know, you're you're debating among yourselves um, whether you've got the phrasing right, and so that can be really helpful. But I think if your organization has a culture where you're comfortable being open, there's really nothing here that's um, private in the sense of confidential. You're trying to understand the environment you work in and deliver services accordingly. So, if if the team is comfortable with displaying the work, I don't see any reason not to. Thank you. We are just about out of time. So MJ, I just want to thank you so much for a fabulous presentation and set of tools. I know this is going to lead to a lot of wonderful and fruitful conversations in our libraries. Um, so thank you for being with us here today. Glad to be so, there. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Absolutely. So this concludes today's webinar. I want to thank all of you for joining us um, and wish you a pleasant afternoon.